TVC, good morning. We are so glad you're with us, whether you're here in person or you're online. I know that our community is experiencing a bit of a COVID surge right now, so many of you are online with us, which we appreciate and we're good with. So hope you are enjoying it from your couch or from your seat this morning. My name's Jordan. I get to bring you just a few really quick announcements. And our first one um, is about our Christmas place. We're going to invite Casey Hastings up, and she is going to give us all the info about it. Hi. Um, like Jordan said, my name is Casey Hastings, and I love stage drama, um, and I love all things that go along with that. So this year, we are doing a kid's Christmas musical, um, and it is called Felix Finds Christmas, um, and it is a sweet story. It's about a little boy named Felix who is looking for his forever family, and throughout the story of the play, we find out that um, his forever family is in the kingdom of God, and um, it's a really, really neat story. Uh, it wraps the Christmas story into it. It's really sweet. So I, I'm up here just to express my um, passion for this. Uh, it's, it's a really neat way for kids to engage with God's word and with the Christmas story in a different way than they ever have before. Um, so that's really special, first of all. They get to sing songs about, um, about Christmas, and they also get to um, learn a little bit about what it's like to share the story of Jesus with other people. So it's a, it's a neat thing. Um, we are having practices Right now, we're having them every morning on Sundays um, at 9.15. So during that first service, you can come and drop your kiddo off with us, and they will get to be a part of it. Um, we've already assigned some speaking roles. So what we're looking for right now is other kids to be in the choir and to be a part of the music part. So we are, we're missing out on some kids, we think. So we really want you to bring your kids to us um, it's not scary. Like, I help them through it. I teach them all the little actions. And I just, it was really fun this morning. We've already practiced once this morning. It's a lot of fun to watch them doing all the actions. So I encourage you to get your kids involved. Um, bring them over at 915, and we will teach them and have a lot of fun. They'll be nice and worn out so that you can go home and get them down for that Sunday nap. Um, so we are uh, performing it on December 19th at 6 p.m., and anybody can come and see it. So uh, that's the special part is they get to share it with their family and their friends. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Yeah, you can applaud for Casey. You can. She's going to go now teach first and second graders, so she needs all your support, prayer and otherwise. So, yes, just to reiterate, we are doing... For kindergarten through sixth grade, we are doing Christmas uh, play practices, first service at 915. So if you want your child to do that, you can. And then the performance is the 19th. So I'm a slow learner. So I just had to reiterate for the other slow learners out there. Um, hey, in the same vein of kids ministry, wanted to let you know that tonight we would normally have Pioneer Clubs, which is Delta and, and Scooters. Um, but we're not able to do that. Uh, because most of our staff is not is either not feeling well or has been diagnosed with COVID. So we're going to take a week off. We're going to get well, and we will do that again uh, next week. So tonight, there's no Pioneer Clubs for K-6 through six like we would normally have it here at the church. Wanted to make you aware of that. And that's been in the email, and that's been on Facebook. So hopefully we've reached everyone with that by now. Really quickly, um, wanted to give you a save the date. We are wanting you to save the date for a parenting conference that is happening January 1st. Nope, sorry. January 14th through 15th. Um, it's just a, a two-day quick conference, but we have some really good things to equip you as parents, not just in parenting your kids, but in discipling your family. Um, to, I've gotten to be in a few of those meetings where we're talking through resources and curriculum, and it all looks really good. We're really excited about it. So there's no chance to sign up yet, but we're just asking you to simply save the date. We'll be talking about it in coming months, um, but be, be ready to commit yourself to that because it's going to be really, really good, and that'll be here at TBC. Last thing is we want to tell you about Starting Point, which is next week. So if you are new to TBC, hopefully you've gotten to go to a newcomer coffee at some point where you just kind of meet people and, and feel a little more a part of 12th. If you have done that and are ready for your next step, Starting Point is for you. It happens um, at 1030 on various Sundays. Our next one is next week. It'll be over in the East Building, and it is kind of your next step to find out even more about who we are at TBC, what do we believe, what are ways that you can get involved and if you're interested in membership, this is also the class that you would take to do that. So if any of that 
is something you're interested in, we wanted to let you know about it. So that is all I have for this morning. Will you guys stand and we're going to pray and then worship? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for a week where you've been so good to us again. Um, because you're so good to us every week. Father, you sent your son to die for us. He, he died in our place. He, he died the death that we deserve so that we could be raised to life with him. And so no matter what we face in life, no matter the struggle, the obstacle, the twist or turn, um, we know that life is good when life is in you, Father. And so we just thank you for your goodness towards us. God, I pray for the times right now. It feels busy. It feels like we're just kind of in the last lap of a long race trying to make it um, to Thanksgiving or to Christmas. It feels like health, even just being well, is such an obstacle right now, and it's just, it can be really wearing. And so, Lord, we just give these things to you this morning. I feel them in my spirit, so we collectively give whatever holds us back this morning over to you. We just ask you to take them because you're good and you're big enough. And you're the place that we go with those things, Father. So this morning as we came in with whatever it was, um, we just direct our hearts towards you right now. And we just give you those things. We don't want to carry them anymore. We are, we are not good at carrying our own junk. God, we need to give it over to you. And so we just do that right now. God, as we prepare our hearts to become closer to you, to focus on you. Um, we just ask that you make yourself known in this place. Father, if there, is, if there is an encouragement that we need, if there is a reminder of truth that we need, if there is a conviction that we need, a calling to repent of something, Father, we, we ask that you make that known in this space right now by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't come here to check a box. We don't come here to do what we're supposed to do. God, we come here because you are the living God, and we want to know you more. And so we thank you that we can gather with our, our brothers and sisters, the body of Christ this morning, whether it's online or in person. And, and God, we just ask you to bless this time. So, Lord, we love you. We give this to you. We, we lift up the worship and the word to you. We just ask you to fill this space. It's in your son's name we pray all these things. Amen.
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, a miracle worker. Good morning, 12th Avenue. I just want to echo um, Jordan's welcome to everyone, whether you're here in person or online. We're just glad that you're able to join us this morning. Um, if you are new to 12th, I want to invite you to visit the information desk in the back. Um, there's just some card that you can um, fill out just to give us a little bit more information about you so that we can connect with you um, wherever you're at on your faith journey. That partnership is super, super important. And so I just encourage you to do that. Um, I wanted to share this morning something that's been on my heart since we started reading um, Hebrews this week um, as a church in the New Testament. And um, I, I love the book of Hebrews because it has all of the connections between um, the New Testament and the gospel and the Old Testament because it was written to Jews and they needed a gospel presentation that included just like these are all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, prophecies that they heard growing up, and just those connections were really important to them. And I, I love that because I like to nerd out on that type of thing, and so it was perfect for me. But as I was reading Hebrews um, again, it just kind of stood out to me in a new way that the book talks, um, starts by talking about Jesus' sovereignty. And I was just kind of thinking about that and just the reality of, Jesus' sovereignty, his supremacy, and his gentleness, and the, the, the power of both and the reality of both of those in our lives and what that means for us. He is both sovereign and gentle in his approach and in his dealings with us. And as I thought more about that, it's like I can really relate to Paul, where in Romans 7 he talks about, um, you know, I do the very thing I don't want to do. What I do is what I hate. He's just stuck in sin, and he recognizes that he couldn't get himself out of that, even if he wanted to. And he, he says, wretched man am I. Who can save me from this body of death? And the only response that he has to his own question is, thank God. And that's all he needed to say. Thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for the reality of who he is, his sovereignty and his gentleness in our lives. And I was really struck by that because honestly, what other words are even worth saying? But thank God. There is no thought more worth our attention, no word more worth our breath. And so I just invite you to enter into that reality. He is sovereign and he is gentle. So I encourage you to, to think about that and ponder that and what that looks like in your lives and simply thank God. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. May what I behold still my anxious heart. Take what I have known and break it all apart. For you, my God, 
are greater still and no sky contains no doubt who restrains all you are the greatness of our God I spend my life to know and I'm far from close to all you are the greatness of our God Give me grace to see beyond this moment here To believe that there is nothing left to fear Greater still than no sky contains, no doubt restrains all who are the greatness of our God. I spend my life to know, and I'm far from close to all who are the greatness of our God. As we move into this next song, I just want to invite you to um, just pray these words as we sing them. Um, and just allow the truth of the words that we're going to sing to just penetrate your heart. Just really meditate on what we're saying. Um, and I invite you to do this standing, sitting, however you feel led. Just to really allow the Holy Spirit to use these words um, to speak to you.
Precious blood has left me forgiven Pure like the whitest of snow Powerful to make sin and shame retreat This covenant is making me whole So I will rise and lift my head For by His mercy my life was spared The highest name has set me free Because of Jesus my heart is clean Purify my heart in your presence Teach me to discover the joy Of holiness that forms as you draw me close In you what was lost is restored So I will My heart is clean, so I will rise and lift my head, for by His mercy my life was spared. The highest name has set me free, because of Jesus my heart is clean. Because of Jesus, my heart is clean. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the thing of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Father God, I just pray that over this congregation, Lord, over this local body, just that we truly would turn our eyes towards you, that you would be that the point of our complete focus, Lord, just that um, our hearts and our minds and our lives would be facing you so that everything else grows dim by comparison. I just pray that that would be true of our hearts and of our lives, Lord, and that that would be evident to everyone around us, just how captivated we are by you. These things I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. For our generosity moment this morning, Scott Waters is sharing with us about faith promise giving. Good morning. 
Uh, as a follow-up to our missions conference from a couple weeks ago, I want to take a minute and explain uh, the way we support our missionaries, and it is through a mechanism called Faith Promise. Um, you, I'm sure, heard reference to it over the last couple of weeks, um, and I want to just make sure that we all have a good understanding of that. If you've been at 12th Avenue for a while, you, you are familiar with it. If you are newer, um, you may be asking, now what, what exactly is that? Um, so, here is a little quick uh, what Faith Promise is and how it works. 12th Avenue has two budgets. We have the general or local budget, and that is staff salaries, uh, youth ministry, our education programs, um, all the things that we do as a church family. Then we also have a missions budget, which is completely separate, which supports the missionaries that were here a couple of weeks ago and, and all the folks that you can read about here in our missions booklet. And so each year at this time, we take a faith promise um, offering, and that is what we use to fund our missionaries. So in the next six or seven weeks, we will put together our missions budget through Faith Promise. Um, Faith Promise simply means that each of us ask God, what's my part? What would you like me to do to be part of your task of building your kingdom and reaching the nations? And so that's something we would do in our quiet time, uh, maybe visiting with a spouse or um, your fellow college students just saying, hey, what, what could I do to be part of missions at 12th Avenue? And so we do that um, by faith, make that decision. Who should participate? Everyone. Children, teenagers, college students, old people like me, everybody should find a part in our missions giving. Um, how do you do that? A number of different ways. You might simply sit down with your family and say, what do we want to do this year for Faith Promise? Look at your budget, you make a decision. It might be in some other way. Number one, unexpected income. Uh, you get a check in the mail that you weren't expecting and say, hmm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, w I wasn't expecting that. I think I'm going to use that for missions. Um, reordering priorities or sacrificial giving. Maybe you were thinking about buying something new, a car this year, uh, more video games, whatever it might be. And you decide, you know what, I think I can hold off a year. We were thinking about getting a car this year. We're going to hold off and we're going to use that money that we had put aside uh, for missions giving this year. Or maybe it's something simple like saying, you know, I like going uh, to Pizza Ranch on Friday nights. I'm going to do it once a month instead of every Friday night. And that money I'm going to use... Uh, for missions this year. Uh, some kind of creative means. True story, I was talking to somebody between services and he came up to me, he had been in first service, and he said, I'm going to do that. He said, I'm going to have an auction and the money that I make, 10% of it, I'm going to give to missions. And I just said, good for you. Great idea. Um, let's see what God does. Maybe you can make things. You're a good uh, baker, or you can make other type of things, and you sell those. And some of that money you use for missions. Some good friends in the church uh, a few years back in the spring had a garage sale. And they decided whatever we make from the garage sale, that's going to be our faith promise. We're going to give that to 12th Avenue Mission. So any number of ways 
that you can just say, God, how I'm, I'm thinking of giving this much money this year. How do you want me to, uh, to do that? What, what are you going to do to provide uh, that money so I can be part of, of your kingdom work? So a um, number of different ways you might do that. So here's what you do. You just ask God, what do you want me to do? What's my part? Is there an amount? God's laying on your heart. And then you follow through and you obey. Uh, in just a minute when we pray, I want you to just silently say, God, is there something you want me to do this year for 12th Avenue Missions? What's my part? And then uh, you fill out a card. Looks like this. I think there's some in the back, probably at the information table. And you say for 2022, I'm committing. And by faith, I think God's going to provide this amount of money. And then you indicate that. Turn your card in to the church office or put it in the box in the back. Tear off the other part and stick it in your prayer book or your Bible and just say, oh, yeah, I committed to give this much money each month to missions. And um, pray and see what God does. Um, all that I've explained is on the inside back page in our little missions book. So if you get home and think, now what What that guy say? What was he talking about? Go to that and it'll explain what faith promise is and how it works. I think I got it. We are going to have our um, giving generosity moment now. And um, if you're at home and you do that, you know, from your home, we'll take a minute for that. And we will um, just have a little bit of quiet prayer. And as I encourage you, ask God, God, what is there something you want me to do this year? And uh, just see, see what he begins to speak to your heart. And then after a few minutes, uh, Jason will close us in prayer and then lead into our teaching time. So let's uh, be silent and go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for giving us a, a vision through our, our missions, giving our, our involvement with missions, a, a sense of what you are doing um, in Emporia, in our region, in our nation, and around the world. Thank you for giving us a picture of what it looks like to, to make disciples in our Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Father, I just ask that you would lay upon our hearts uh, how we can be involved in that. Father, pray that you would um, guide us to, to give generously, to give out of love. And Father, pray that we would um, be able just to celebrate with joy that we were a part of translating the Bible into, into new languages, that we were a part of seeing how uh, people are reached in, in difficult places. Father, just ask that you would guide um, guide our hearts, guide our minds in thinking about how we can be a part of that in our church, and thank you for that opportunity. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Well, I wanted to uh, start us off this morning with one of my favorite icebreaker kind of questions. A lot of college students have heard me ask this question before, and it's, uh, it's intentional, very serious question. Actually, it's not, it's not at all serious, but it is intentional. kind of takes us into to how I want us to, to start thinking this morning about our text. I want to ask you to consider and maybe talk to your neighbor if there's somebody that you came to church with, a family or a friend. I want you to consider if you had a superpower, 
what would your superpower be? Now, just to give you an example, I know for a fact that Superman is the best of all of the superheroes. There's really no uh, comparison to Superman. If you think that I'm wrong, like we can debate later, you can come find me up front and I'll explain to you why Superman is the best of all of the superheroes. So here's the deal. I'm going to pick one of Superman's superpowers. If I was going to pick a superpower, I would pick flight. That I could just, I need to go see someone across the country, boom, I don't need to catch a, a plane, I don't need to get in the car, I just fly there. And someone after first service uh, was talking to me and said, well, I'm scared of heights. And I was like, wait, so am I. So I don't know what to do. Uh, I'm not really comfortable with anything above six feet and four inches. And so I don't know how I reconcile my uh, scared of being scared of heights and flight as a superpower. But that's what I would pick, would be, would be flight. Now, I want you to, to just give it some thought, you know, consider it deeply. It seems silly, it is, but it'll lead into something that I want us to get to. So take like two minutes and give some thought, talk to somebody sitting next to you if, that's, uh, if that works for you, and share what you would pick as your one superpower. So take like two minutes and do that. Hopefully you've got a superpower in mind. One of the things that I think is compelling about superheroes, maybe the, maybe the more compelling thing than a superpower is actually the origin story. You know, where did this person come from and, and their weakness? You know, if it's like Superman and Kryptonite, I think those are some of the most compelling reasons why those, uh, those stories are a part of our culture. Uh, I was thinking about the superhero idea and what I wanted to illustrate to get us started with. And then my daughter Annalie came home with this. I think there's a picture of this. She had made a Captain America shield out of recycled bottle caps. So that was sitting at home. Um, the origin story, I don't know. I, I've told college students the last uh, superhero movie I watched was the very first Iron Man movie, which was like before they were born or something a long time ago. Um, but uh, Captain America's, uh, like his origin story, he goes from being a weakling to uh, he takes super soldier serum, which sounds like something ridiculous and made up that would be in a comic book. And then he becomes the pinnacle of, of strength and ability, like the, the ultimate soldier. And so he's got this backstory and he has a, a super power. And so I love the backstory and I love these ideas of a super power. Set that aside for just a moment in your, in your brain, in your mind, set it on the shelf. We'll get it back out in a second. I want to share with you some good news and some bad news for us who uh, follow Jesus. Here's the bad news. Those in our community, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's somebody on your dorm floor, maybe uh, somebody across town or across the world, the people in our community who are most in need of the good news of Jesus, when they are, are polled, when they're asked, when they're surveyed, what do you think about Christians? They are the ones who view Christians most negatively. The people who are most in need of the gospel see Christians oftentimes as cold, judgmental, angry people. Consistently when they're surveyed, that's the answer. Here's the good news. I know that we're not that way, or that we don't have to be that way. If we are not naturally warm, caring, loving, forgiving people, we have a super power on our side, a super natural power. The, the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, for every follower of Jesus, 
The, the gospel, the power of the Spirit is at work to transform us into people who are not like we used to be, to transform us into people who love our neighbors, who are willing to, to take God's word to heart and, and let God work in our lives. That's our superpower. It's the power of the gospel to change us and to change the world that we live in. That's the good news. And so this morning, I want us to look at one of my favorite kind of overlooked passages of Scripture, and it's the book of Philemon. If you're reading in the New Testament reading plan, we've, we've gone through Philemon. It's short. It's only one chapter long, and it's a very personal letter from Paul to a, a church leader named Philemon, and it's in regards to their, uh, this uh, slave named Onesimus. And so you've, you've got this one chapter book, and, and I would summarize it for us this morning in this way. The whole book could be summarized this way. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to transform our lives and transform the community that we live in with love and virtue. Or maybe to put it another way, how we treat people should be radically transformed by the gospel. So I want to show you how this plays out in the text this morning. I'm going to read most of this little short book, Philemon, and then I need to do three things. First thing I need to do is explain a little bit about first century slavery and the context of how this book comes about. Then I want to show you how Paul's appeal, his appeal to Philemon and Onesimus, he doesn't just tell them, hey guys, be good. He doesn't say that. He says, be transformed, be changed by the gospel in order to make this relationship right. And then the last thing I want to do this morning is share with us, as a community of believers, I think we need to consider how we can be so spiritually transformed that we impact the community that we live in. So let's read in Philemon. I'm going to read verses 8 through 21. And here's what the text says. Starting in verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him back, who is my very heart, back to you, and I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong and owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Let me explain a little bit of the context, the, the backstory, if you will, of uh, Philemon and Onesimus. So Philemon was a leader in the city of Colossae. He's a leader in this group of house churches, and he's associated with Paul's letter to the Colossae, the Colossians. Uh, you find that in our, our New Testament. And Philemon was a man who had a servant named Onesimus. Now what likely happened is Onesimus, this slave or servant to Philemon, uh, likely stole something and ran away. He, he ran away to, to disappear in the big city of Rome. In Rome is where Paul is in prison. He is in jail, writing letters and sending them out to, to Timothy and sending them out to the Colossian church and uh, trying to 
to convince as many Roman soldiers who are standing next to him that Jesus is the Son of God. So he's in Rome doing this work, and somehow Paul and Onesimus, their paths cross. And Paul leads Onesimus to faith in Jesus. And Onesimus accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord, as his Savior. And Paul says to Onesimus, now what you have to do is you have to go and make things right with your past master, Philemon. And he writes a letter, Paul does, he writes a letter and he hands it to Onesimus and says, all right, now you're the courier, deliver this letter. And he goes back to Colossae, he goes to Philemon and he says, here I am, read this. So he shows up and that's what we have as the letter Philemon, is that Paul sends Onesimus back in order to, with these instructions from Paul, on how to make the relationship right. Now, as you read this and you read about the language of slavery, it's really easy for us as modern people to think about slavery in Civil War era America. And it's a little bit different than that. I need to explain a little bit of first century Roman slavery. When this letter was written, uh, probably in the 60s AD, um, Paul is in Rome and the population of Rome would have been around a million people. So Paul's in, in Rome, about a million people, and the, the spread of slavery, of servitude in the Roman Empire was, was widespread. And they have some estimates that the city of Rome, if there's a population of a million people, the number of slaves in that population is approaching about half of the entire population. So if there's a million people in Rome, maybe 400,000 of them are slaves. Those are slaves, that, and across the Roman Empire, this was true, that, that slaves are, are kind of concentrated in the big cities, and they would have served in a variety of places. They would have served as like a, a household servant, someone who helped to, to take care of household chores. There would have been slaves who worked in the fields. There would have been slaves who worked in the mines. And the way slavery worked in the, the first century is a little bit different than, than we might think about it. Slaves in the Roman Empire were primarily gathered from the, the population of these conquered states. Someone in the first century, or someone in the first century, someone in the first service, after I was preaching this in the first service, they came up and said, kind of like POWs. And I was like, well, kind of like that at first, that if you lost the battle to the, a Roman army, they would gather up all of those conquered soldiers, anyone who's standing around who didn't have any power to defend themselves, and you are now a slave in the Roman Empire. And so the, the population of conquered people could have been uh, Greeks, uh, Germanic states, Western Europe, North Africa, all of these regions were slowly but surely conquered by Rome and their inhabitants become slaves in the Roman Empire. So you've got multi-ethnic, um, all kinds of different languages. They look different, um, but they're all slaves in the Roman Empire. And Onesimus is one of them. And he heads off to Rome. And this is kind of an interesting side note. Either there's a, a great coincidence or it's the sovereignty of God that Onesimus finds Paul. Imagine if I told you to like go to Kansas City. And the, I, I think of the entire population of Kansas City on the Kansas side would be about a million people. So if I say go to KCK and find one person that you've never met before in the mix of, of everyone in Kansas City, that's who you're looking for. Onesimus is not looking for Paul, unless he is. If Onesimus had somehow knew who Paul was in his interaction in Philemon's home, maybe he sought Paul out, or maybe, as Paul kind of alludes, perhaps this was the sovereignty of God, that, that God would find you and save your soul, and then I would send you back to save this relationship. And so I think that might be what's happening there, is this, this sovereignty of God that Onesimus bumps into Paul in the big city of Rome. But back to, to slavery. So slaves in the Roman Empire, um, there were slaves who had freedom. They would work in a household or they'd work in the field and they would work for a set amount of time. They would receive a wage. There are even records of some slaves in the Roman Empire who possessed slaves of their own. And so it's a little bit different from what we might imagine. The average um, time of servitude within slavery in the Roman Empire was about 10 years. And so they could have received wages, they could have, they had a certain freedom to come and go, but they certainly couldn't change jobs, they couldn't run away to Rome. And, and there certainly was some slavery um, 
slavery in mining, uh, for example, that was you know, cruel, harsh conditions and really, really difficult. So that's part of what's going on in first century slavery. Now, I have run into this with college students who maybe have been asking questions or they, they've talked with somebody on their dorm floor who's pretty skeptical of Christianity and says, you know, Christianity uh, approves of slavery. Or they've asked the question, why doesn't Paul just outright condemn slavery? And I think I need to, to answer that and provide a little bit of, of nuance in terms of what's happening in the first century or throughout uh, God's word when it deals with slavery. So both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God's people live in cultures and among pagan people who embraced slavery. They're surrounded by neighbors, they're surrounded, sometimes ruled by countries or people who embrace slavery. But God's word, God, and the authors of scripture have never created slavery. But living in cultures where slavery was present, the Bible has regulated slavery and regulated in the direction of justice and mercy. In the first century, in the world where the New Testament was written and its authors lived, women, children, and slaves had no rights at all. They were essentially possessions in the culture and in the, the kind of the context of where these people lived. So the authors of the New Testament do something in that cultural situation. They extend to women, children, and slaves a, uh, um, a guidance in terms of their moral authority to decide for themselves how to live in that difficult circumstance. The, the New Testament says if you find yourself in this position, you are a full-fledged person and you have authority to figure out how to make choices that are appropriate where you're at. And so throughout these texts, the leaders of the first century churches tell women, children, and slaves, you have a capacity to decide for yourself because you are a full-fledged person. You can decide how to feel. You have equal value among all people as you stand before God. And that was a radically countercultural message that the New Testament writers gave to Christians in the first century. I believe that the instruction of the New Testament provided this growing Christian community a radically new ethic, an ethic of impartial love, of mutual service, of equal accountability that eventually plays in to the end of slavery across the Roman Empire. As the number of Christians in the empire gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the role of slavery gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it comes to an eventual end. So that's a key thing that I think is happening behind the scenes, the, the back story, the origin story of Philemon and Onesimus and Paul. I want you to shift gears and think about what the text has to say about how these three men have been transformed by the gospel. First thing I want you to catch is in verse 9, and it's Paul's appeal on the basis of love. Here's what Paul says in verse 9. He could be, he says, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. So Paul was a, a spiritual authority. He's like a shepherd, and the folks that he's writing to are the sheep. He could have said, this is my, my order to you. He could have boldly commanded Philemon, Here's what you have to do concerning Onesimus. One, two, three. He could have laid it out in that way, but that's not what he does. Instead of issuing an order, Paul makes an appeal. Paul is confident that the gospel has so transformed Philemon that he will be willing to take this big significant loss and receive Onesimus and not receive him as a slave, but receive him as a brother. Paul would like Onesimus to return and help in the work that he's doing. If you read through um, all of these texts at the end of Paul's life, like 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, you find that his work from prison becomes more and more difficult. People begin to abandon Paul right and left, and he knows that Onesimus has been a service to him. So Paul would love for Onesimus to return and help in the work that he's doing. But that could only happen with the consent of Philemon. 
He doesn't order Philemon to send Onesimus back. He says, I appeal to you on the basis of love that you would decide this. Paul's confident in the power of God to change human nature, that it would be at work in Philemon so that he would make exactly the choice that seems best to Paul. Second thing that I want you to see in terms of the transformation of the gospel is what Paul says in verses 15 and 16, that you have a brother and not a slave. Here's what Paul says in 15 and verse 16. Perhaps the reason that he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but he would be even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. The New Testament uses the the imagery, the language of family when it talks about who we are in relationship to God and relationship to each other. The imagery of brother and sister. And it helps to transform our view of how to interact in the church. Paul will, will lay this out in several different places. Here's how you view older women. Here's how you view younger women. Here's how you view an older man and a younger man. That these are brothers and sisters and that together we make up the children of God. So Paul gives us that imagery in the text that he lays out. He also lays out in places like Galatians chapter 3 that you no longer can view each other as separate. You you no longer can view each other as, as Jewish and Gentile as slave and free, but you see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. So there's no longer a distinction, and Paul prohibits the use of power to control each other. I was thinking about this in the the first service and explained that in my household and in my growing up years and in my children, they sometimes use power as brothers and sisters. Like, I'm bigger than you, I'm stronger than you, so I get to control the remote control when we're watching TV. Or I'm bigger than you, so I get the last piece of dessert or whatever it is. And you can you know kind of relate to that, I imagine. Beyond that, as you grow into adult brothers and sisters, you understand that there isn't a dynamic of I'm bigger than you and I'm stronger than you or I'm older than you, but there's a love for one another. There's a care for one another in family that Paul lays out for us. And what that means is that there's no longer a a power or control dynamic in the church. He doesn't make any room for that. He says that passes away and instead see each other as family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. So Paul says to Philemon, you have lost a slave, but you have gained an eternal brother in Christ. Third thing that I want you to see about this transformation of the gospel in these individuals is how the gospel has shaped Paul into a self-sacrificing father in the faith. If you look at verse 19, Paul says this, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Let me explain a little bit about what Paul is saying here. Paul frequently would have used assistants like a a secretary, someone like Timothy or a professional scribe to write down his letters that we have in the New Testament. Part of the reason for that was the the materials, you know, I can print this on my computer on a piece of paper, uh, practically for free. It cost me, I don't know, a few cents to print out text on paper, but Paul didn't have that in the first century. They would have used expensive materials like vellum or papyrus, and he's trying to pack as much content into each um, piece of of papyrus or vellum to be sent across the, the Roman Empire. And so instead of writing that with his own hand, he would have hired a professional scribe to help him do that. And there's some question about as he grows older, if there's a problem with Paul's eyesight. And so maybe his handwriting is maybe like your local doctor. It's like a scrawl that's hard to read and and it gets messy. So he says he hires a professional or he has a secretary and he dictates these letters and they write it down. But at a couple of key points in the different letters from Paul, we get this. I'm writing this part with my own hand. Do you recognize my handwriting, my name? Essentially, my name is on the dotted line. And in this, he says, I'm writing this with my own hand. Whatever Onesimus owes you, Philemon, I'm going to pay for it. 
My name is signed on the dotted line. I will make a, a, a sacrifice to make things right between the two of you. Paul has been shaped by the gospel. There are places where Paul is willing to pay for the spread of the gospel with his own life, that he risks life and limb, that he's arrested and beaten and shipwrecked in order to spread the gospel. But here he says, in order to make this relationship right over the heart of the gospel, I'm willing to pay out of my own pocket to make this happen. I think that's a sign that Paul has been shaped by the gospel, turned into a self-sacrificing father in the faith. The last thing we've got to think about is how all of this applies to us. And the question that I would ask to kind of move us into this is, have we been likewise transformed by the gospel? I want to ask you a series of application questions, and I want to do this in a spirit of prayer Oftentimes I'll use the, the illustration, as I give these questions to you, I want you to think of your heart as like the dashboard of your car. When um, on my dashboard of my truck, when my gas is running out, a red light pops on and I know, uh-oh, it's time to get more gas. As I read these questions, I want you to think of your heart as like the dashboard of a car. And maybe as I read one of these questions, a light comes on and you realize that one applies to me and I need to give it some thought and some prayer. So with that attitude of prayer, I want you to, to listen to these questions and take a little moment to reflect on how you would answer them. First question I want you to think about in terms of application for, for our lives is this. Are there social and cultural structures around us that we all take for granted that should be transformed by our love and self-sacrifice? This would be those parts of life that we would say, it shouldn't be this way, but that's just how it is. How can our love transform these parts of life? Second question for you to consider. Are there relationships inside of the Christian community that have been broken by financial loss that you should do something to make right. There aren't as many people the, in second service this morning. Maybe our numbers are down. I'm going to guess that looking at this room, someone has been on the, the hurt end of some financial loss. Jesus says, instead of fighting one another about issues like this, that we should rush to make things right with our neighbors. So is there anything that pops on your heart radar when I ask, are there relationships inside of this community that have been broken by financial loss that need to be made right? Third question for us to consider. Are there individuals in the community of believers that you see as having some limited worth or value where you need to transform your outlook on them to that of a brother or a sister. Scripture doesn't allow us to have like a, a caste system like they have in Hinduism where some people in the community are, are untouchables. There isn't room for us to have a, a sense of like royalty in, in our spirituality, people who are extra spiritual or holy but instead, we're to see each other as equal at the foot of the cross. So, is there any way that you would be treating someone as less than a brother or sister? Fourth question, have you run away from a painful situation where you need to go back and make things right, even at some cost to yourself? Maybe you haven't literally run away to the big city like Rome. If you're here on Sunday morning in Emporia, Kansas, that's not, uh, uh, you're not running away to a big city to disappear like Onesimus. But perhaps there's a situation in life where you haven't run away in place, but in, in your heart you've run away and you need to go back and make things right.
Last thought or question in closing this morning that I have for you is this. I don't know if any of you have read this in our, our New Testament reading. Maybe you, you read through the story of Philemon and Onesimus. You get to the end and, and Paul says, here's this appeal that I'm making. I have confidence that the gospel has transformed you so that you would make this right. And then the letter goes off and you ask yourself, well, what happened? How did Onesimus and Philemon, how did they get things right? How did Philemon respond as he reads through this letter? And here's an interesting note. The letter might have been read in the context of the whole church that's gathered. How do they respond to each other? Does it, does it work out okay in the end? And we don't really know. It's not uh, answered in Scripture. It's not answered in God's Word. But here's what the, the history, church history says. Church history says that the tradition is that Onesimus, the one-time slave, now set free in relationship with Paul and the gospel and Philemon, Onesimus becomes a bishop, a high leader within the church. And one of the reasons that, that church history says that is that perhaps Onesimus, in becoming a church leader, had said, this is the letter that proves that I'm no longer a slave and now I'm set free. This letter proves that I have a right to be in the community and a leader within the church, and that maybe he influences other church leaders to get the, the letter to Philemon into the text of Scripture. That's kind of one of the, the theories within church history. I want to provide another thought for you. There are a couple of phrases within this letter that I want to read back to you again. One of them is this, I will pay the price to restore this man to right relationship. In reading Philemon just a moment ago, that sounds like something that Paul says, but we could just as easily put that statement onto the lips of Jesus. That Jesus is the one who restores us to right relationship with the Father. He is the one who pays the price to make the relationship right. Jesus is the one who pays the price, not for an individual slave, but pays the price for all of human sin. At great cost to himself, at the ultimate cost to himself, he makes us right with the Father. Here's another phrase that shows up in Philemon. Don't look upon this man to see his past, but see him as you would look upon me. Paul says that, but again, it could just as easily be words on the lips of Jesus. Don't look at this man, someone like me, don't look at me and see my past, but see the righteous life of Jesus applied to me through the, the blood shed on the cross. Don't look on this man and see the past, but see Jesus. Like those statements are, are even, to me, more powerful, more convincing than the story of church history, that maybe it all works out in the end. I think these truths teach us about who Jesus is and the, the example of Philemon and Onesimus. It's about them. It's about slavery. It's about the first century. But maybe more than anything else, it's about the gospel, that Jesus is the one who pays the price for our sin and makes it so that we can have right relationship with the Father. If that message is news to you, if that message is something that you've never believed before, you stand before the Father and say, I'm here, I have this letter, I have this thought that maybe I can be made right. Um, but there's a, a peace that remains. You have to take a step of faith, of belief. You have to come before the Father and say, I want that payment. I want to be recognized as righteous before you because of who Jesus is, because I'm not right on my own. I desire for this payment in my place. If that's true for you and you, you need to talk some more about that, I'd love to talk with you some more. Let me pray for us to that end. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that we if we are yours, if we have recognized you as Lord and Savior in our lives, if we have repented of sin and have been made right with you, we are no longer slaves. We're no longer slaves to sin or the past or our mistakes, but we have been set free. 
Father, I pray that we would see ourselves as set free by the power of the gospel, empowered by the Holy Spirit to change the communities that we live in. Father, I pray that we would be able to to live with such grace and mercy and forgiveness with one another, that we would have this, this power of the transformation of the gospel, a supernatural power to to make things right with other people, to forgive other people, to to love and care, even if it costs us something. Father, I pray that we would live in that way, in such a winsome and compelling way, that the world around us wouldn't see us as angry or judgmental, but they would see us as forgiving and merciful and loving and be drawn to you, drawn to you on display in our lives. Father, I pray that, that these truths demonstrated in your word would sink deep into our hearts and minds and transform us even as we read them, transform us as we go about our day uh, next week on a, on a Monday morning. Let us live transformed by the gospel. Amen. Well, guys, if you have questions about that, if you have questions about first century slavery, if you're trying to understand that, I'd love to talk with you some more. If you need to know more about who Jesus is as the one who sets us free, love to talk with you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Have a great day.